The Diesel Podcast. Digital integration in English as a second or other language. Episode 14, interview with Judy Haynes. Welcome to the Diesel Podcast, episode number 14. We are your hosts. I am Brent Warner. And I'm Michelle Reyes. And we have a special guest for you guys. Very special guest today. Yes, we do. Judy Haynes, how are you? Hi, how are you, Brent and Michelle? Thank uh, we you are. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Judy, we are so excited to to talk with you today. And I'm actually going to for for our listeners. I'm going to read um, your bio. This comes from the TESOL blog. But if there's anything in there that is outdated or you need to um, correct me on, please do it at the uh, uh, when I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I'm done. So, Judy Haynes taught elementary ESL for 28 years and is the author and co-author of eight books for teachers of ELs. The most recent being teaching to strengths, supporting students living with trauma, violence, and chronic stress with Devi Zakarian and Lourdes Alvarez Ortiz. She was a columnist for the TESOL publication Essential Teacher and is also co-founder and co-moderator of the Twitter chat for teachers of English learners, hashtag LChat, and that's hashtag ELL chat. And that is where I met Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Judy, so, uh, Ishelle uh, reached out to me uh, after the last episode. We've been talking, of course, about uh, you know the craziness of the world and how people are dealing with things in different ways. Some people are being, um, you know, positive and trying to get things going, and other people are really stressed out and uh, don't know exactly what they're going to do. And some people are really reaching out for like the humanity amongst their students. Um, and, uh, and there's just a whole wide uh, world of variety of how people are dealing with teaching with all of these things and um and Michelle pointed out that you're you're a specialist in the area and you've just got so much a wealth of knowledge uh that's worth talking about and that people really need to hear um and so uh so I was excited when she said well let's let's see if if uh, Judy will come and talk to us and then you said <laughs> yes so so uh, we do want to say thank you and appreciate you coming on mm -hmm. to uh, share your ideas oh you're welcome <laughs> so Judy, I know that you you work mostly with K through twelve, um, correct? With I mean well, with well, you, you K six. K six. So you're in the elementary um, aspect of things. We teach uh, Brent. You are well, teaching I higher was an elementary ed, teacher. Um, e ESL, ESL adult, adult learners, correct? At the moment. Correct. So I teach at the community college. And, mm -hmm. um, and Michelle works with adults, but I think all of these ideas kind of yes. spread across mm -hmm. everything. I don't, I don't think it really matters when we're talking about reaching out to everybody. Right. And it's just one of those, you know, we want to also make sure we, we're representing our K, K-12 and K, K-6 um, in, in here. But some of the issues that teachers were happen to be bringing up um, in, in the L chat are issues that are hit home with the adult students. I mean, there's still language learners. There's still um, some of them are foreign in here from other countries some of them may be refugees and so um, I thought that it would be you know um, you've written a, a recent article on the TESOL blog about supporting ELs social emotional learning in a virtual classroom so um, what are your thoughts or what what where where do we where do we start <laughs> well we we can start I, actually this on that blog this was a, the last thing I mentioned but it's really starting with ourselves and as teachers to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and we're not, I, I found that teachers are very stressed right now. They're very anxious, oh, yes. overwhelmed. Teaching online, it, it's new for the kids and it's new for the teacher. And, um, you know, they're doing a wonderful job, but you have the pressures of having the parent be there all the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, when they, especially with the younger kids. And, um, of kids that don't show up to class and you you have to track them down. Sometimes uh, you can't find students at all because they 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 maybe don't have any kind of uh, a device or or um, Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So you you may not be able to find them. Uh, I know Larry Falazzo said in one of the videos that he did that he found some of his kids by calling their friends on the phone. Mm. And, you know, the kids had phones, but they weren't registered with the school, so they had no idea how to get in touch with them. 
So that, those are high school kids. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's really that we need to we need to start with making sure that we're not over pressured and not um, so hassle uh, that that we can't we can't really operate. I know my daughter is a special ed teacher and uh, and a, for fifth and sixth grade, and she's teaching every day. And she's not done until four or five in the afternoon because she they have meetings and all this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I find that she's really stressed. Absolutely. And I worry about it. I worry about it because she's worried about her kids. Now, these kids all have their parents there and whatever. And she, you know, had no problem finding them or anything like that. But um, she's under a lot of a lot of scrutiny and what, whatever. And I think it's really hard. You can't do some of the things that you need to do with special ed kids if you can't, if you if they're not in the room. Right. And and I think that's, you know, that's just such a thing for us to just sit there, sit, sit and, and ponder for a moment because we're all going through this. And I, 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 I feel that from my own colleagues, they, they want to be the best teachers they can for their students. Right. right? right. And so they already put, you know, they already want to do the best under circumstances that are really not the best, nor do we have the, the proper tools. So um, that, that really hits home for right. us. And, and basically, we, we need to make time for ourselves to do things like go out for a walk or, or do some kind of exercise or yoga or something, listen to music, uh, anything that you, you can do to kind of relieve that tension that you're feeling as a teacher. And then, and then you may, you know, have a little better frame of mind when you're on that computer almost all day long. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I mean, I was just, um, I trained a group of, of instructors today, um, uh, basic training on zoom because many of us were just forced into the remote teaching emergency remote teaching. Right. And without really having the proper platforms and then realizing that not all our students also have availability to to or access. So um, and in and just in 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 talking to people as as we're 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 realizing, hey, we're actually sitting in front of the computer for much longer than you would ever be doing on a regular day to day basis. You're being exposed to blue light, which um, affects your circadian rhythms, and then you're actually now working from home. So there's just so much, so many layers of 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 stress and already, you know, we, we already want to be the best teachers that we can for our, for our students for, and, and, and so it just, just becomes um, difficult to manage or to know how to manage it perhaps. Yes. And I don't know whether you, well, you're, if you're teaching a higher ed level, you probably won't see the um, number of kids that don't have Wi-Fi at home. Mm-hmm. And the only device they may have mm-hmm. is their phone, which is better than nothing. Um, some school districts have, uh, purchase a mobile hotspots for their students. And basically what it is uh, was that they drive around in a school bus or something like that from, you know, and park in different neighborhoods where they know the kids won't, won't have uh, Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. And it, we need to be willing to spend this kind of money. A lot of districts have, have gone out and bought, um, you know, different kinds of uh, small computers or whatever for their kids to use. And, uh, uh, but still there are an awful lot of districts that can't even reach, you know, 40% of their students. So right. it's a huge problem. And if this goes on and, and it continues through the, uh, end of school in New Jersey doesn't get out till the end of June. So, um, if that goes on, yes. it's, it's a real problem. Yes. You can't you know, reach those students. Yeah. So I've got a friend who's uh, doing kind of the same thing. He's like out there he works in a small district, but uh, you know, he's out there climbing telephone poles, looking for the highest place that he can offer to put a, um, you know, like a, a router for the kids. And so he's trying to find all the different ones that are high enough in his little town to, to reach out to everybody so that they can all get access to, uh, all the things that they need when they're not able to come into school. I mean, people are really, you know, going above and beyond, but it's also, it's exhausting, right? It's, it's so much work and it's so much to do. Well, you know, I, I was so moved. The last the alt chat that we did last Monday night was, was on some problems that we haven't discussed already. And I asked people um, how they were reaching out 
to their students and their families. And the things that people wrote were so moving. And these teachers are going so far above and beyond, uh, you know, what what uh, they would normally do if they were in a, a regular classroom. It's not that they wouldn't go and help the students then, but this is teachers, a teacher who's working in a food bank that makes sure that her students all get food because she's working in a food bank and she can take them uh, the food, ba- you know, the food and make contact with them um, and make sure that they're getting, they're being able to do the work that they need to do. So it, it's just some really beautiful stories. And if you look through the L chat um, stream, you can go way back and, and see a whole chat uh, if you want. It's, there's, it's amazing what teachers are doing. I'm just absolutely yeah, blown it's, away it's by it. Inspiring. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. I keep looking at it. That's why I love teacher Twitter so much is like everybody does such awesome work. And I've learned so much just from those chats. Sometimes I'm not participating, but I'm watching. So I've encouraged a lot of my colleagues who are not on Twitter yet to just, right. just go follow. You don't even need an account. Just go follow because you're going to get back so much positivity um, when we're already inundated in negativity. Right, right. And basically, at the beginning of each chat, I usually ask a question about what are the problems, whatever, to give people a chance to get that out, out of their system. So the oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Question the second question in chat is always related to what are the problems you're seeing and what difficulties do you encounter or whatever, whatever the subject is. It could be anything. And I'll ask that kind of a question. And then the third question is, is inevitably something to do about what strategies are you using to meet the needs of the students in whatever area it is. And, um, and from there on, it's, everything is positive. So people need a chance to kind of vent at times because they don't really have any other place to do it. Um, they don't want to vent where their, where their school, they're going to get in trouble or something or, um, you know, so, so basically we have, um, in the beginning of a chat, you'll see some of that, but that's maybe the first 15 minutes at the most. And I love um, that though, I love that you're transitioning that because yeah. we were talking about that before. Um, Ishel was telling me about one of the major uh, groups that is formed on Facebook and it just seems to be everybody just complaining all day long with no real guidance right. to move yeah. into positivity. Right. Yeah. And so and if you say something positive, people jump all over you. We never have it on L chat. We never have anybody coming in and saying nasty things. Mm-hmm. And that just really amazes me because I really only people know about it. And most of the teachers that know about it are teachers that either saw one of my ads for the chat, you know, the day before or the day of, and, and come and try it out or they're, they're ESL teachers or bilingual teachers. So right. um, we never get people jumping in. And, and sometimes I've, I've not used a question because I didn't want any negative. Uh, our example is the last chat. I didn't use the word undocumented immigrant because I didn't want somebody from the outside the chat yeah. to see that on the mainstream and jump in and say something nasty that we would have to mm-hmm. then handle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that could be disastrous. We don't right. really have that. And there's no way to block, there's no way to block them out, really. Right. Right. So. So basically, that's I, the, um, working on that and writing these blogs have, have really given me um, a lot of happiness during this time. I feel connected. I feel useful. Um, and I when I see what teachers are doing, I just I'm just so amazed at how, how much they're doing and how hard they work. And it's just something that um, warms my heart. It makes me really proud of our profession. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. I, I've been, again, like I said, I've been training people and it's so hard, especially when some of them don't have internet access, but you get back feedback that says, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your patience. And it's like, oh, I am useful. <laughs> Whatever you <laughs> took, even though I couldn't really, I couldn't answer your Wi-Fi issue. Like, it's that time that just spent with them. And so you make a good point. Um, you, you talk, you talked about how Larry Ferlazzo was, was, um, connecting to his students and I'm just, and you, you talked about developing, um, ways to take care of ourselves and your, your blog post talks about developing a positive self-talk and that's something I'm really big on. So what can you, can you, well, this is something I use a lot with my students because I, mm-hmm. I, I did a chapter on bullying um, for TESOL. 
mm-hmm. in, in anthology. And, um, uh, and I did it with a coworker who was not an ESL person, but had a lot of, uh, of my students in her class. And what we found was that the English learners were much more apt to be bullied, mm-hmm. even though, and, and so, and it became a problem. Sometimes the problem erupted into the ESL classroom because they couldn't really, their parents would tell them. Parents didn't see that bullying, that name calling and everything. They didn't see that as anything that their kids should pay attention to. They said, oh, just don't, don't make a big deal about it. And so the kids would be, and they're, you know, they're, they're fifth and sixth grade. So they're getting to, you know, they're getting to be uh, preteens and whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and the whole idea of positive self-talk, I use that a lot with them. And I had, had them do a unit on bullying uh, where they drew a picture of it. Of, uh, and they, they co-wrote with, uh, you know, two or three people together scenarios where there was a bully, one person played the bully, and then they acted it out, they drew a picture. And what, I, what they came up with was just amazing. And it gave me such an insight into what, the, what, what life they were actually lead, leading. And, you know, I found things out like that um, they, most of my students were Korean and um, that people made fun of their eyes. You know, they come up and they pull their eyes back and, and make fun of them. And they just didn't know how to answer something like that. It's just, um, and it just, it just broke my heart. So teaching kids to say either in their own language, they have a script, kind of like, I am, uh, I am good, I am smart, mm-hmm. and on and on. Whatever that script is, it can be in English, it can be in their ho- own language. But to treat them, to teach them how to say that kind of a, a uh, positive uh, affirmation over and over again and walking away and not showing that they're upset or anything, just walking away uh, is, is really uh, something that's very useful. And I think it's useful to almost anybody. Absolutely. Um, I, I could use that kind of. Uh, absolutely. One of the things that I've, I've um, or one of the ways I, I give myself self-affirmations all the time, but when dealing with tech, especially right now, I have to tell um, my colleagues, remember, be kind to yourself at the end of the day. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. It's not you. It's a situation you can't control it. So it's, it is that self-narrative that you're, you're training yourself um, to be positive, right? And that, that self-talk is so important for our, our ELs, especially when they don't have the words to stand up necessarily. But you're right. I had never thought about, um, I actually never thought about teaching them that they could just say it to themselves in their own language. That's got to be really powerful. I had one student that drew a picture of the lunch that his mother sent to school. He was Japanese. And he had brought this beautiful lunch to school every day with, uh, with kind of raw fish and rice, you know, in, in his lunch. And the, somebody said to him, uh, your lunch smells terrible. Mm. And his self-affirmation was, I love Japanese food. This is mm. a food in my country. Um, uh, Japanese people don't think this smells terrible. You know, and this, is, this was his, the affirmation that he wrote. And I thought, you know... No. That's that. I felt that really helped him. You know, yeah, kind of put that behind helps me right now. Just hearing yeah, you talk about like, it. Oh yeah. my gosh, it is. It is. It's so empowering. That yeah. is so empowering. So, uh, so that, that was you know that was something that I carried with me from the time that I wrote that that chapter, which was I don't know, fifteen years ago maybe. And from that time on, and I've carried that idea of. Uh, a positive self-talk and it, it appears in a lot of the things that I write. Mm-hmm. Um, so Judy, one of the things that you, uh, you talked about, uh, in your most recent article or your most recent blog post here, um, could, because of all the switches to online and, you know, all of these ideas, um, is you're talking a little bit about, um, uh, giving your students brain breaks during the online sessions because you know, we're staring at the screen all day long. Um, yeah. and, and I think it takes more of our brain than we think it does looking at the screen versus having a classroom to look around. Um, can you share a little bit about what your what your idea is here and what's going on? Well, I just think that kids can't be, um, the younger they are, the more often you need to take these breaks. And you don't have to do it by having them leave the computer. You can have them do things that 
that you can see right there and everybody else can see they can do it. I mean, right now I could stretch or, or kind of um, just move my shoulders around or any, anything where they could. Uh, the problem is if you let the students get up and, and run around the room or something, you might have a problem getting them back. <laughs> you have to have a strategy to get them back. And it could be a word, it could be a clap sequence or whatever something to get, make sure that when they hear that, they have to come back to the computer. So, you know, whatever works and how, depending on how big the group is that you're uh, working with, because if it's really big, you'll have that much more problem getting them back. So you have to be careful, but it's, kids need those breaks. And one of the things I loved, I wrote another blog um, with um, my co-authors of, of the book you mentioned, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Your Strengths. And um, uh, I, in that blog, we talked about um, the that breathing ball, the Hoberman mm-hmm. breathing ball, and I had never even heard of that. And can, to me, can that, you share a little bit about what that is? Well, uh, I, I have a link to it. Um, mm-hmm. I have a link to it in the article, and basically, it's um, the it, this, go ahead. this ball that you um, that you push in and out. It's it's not a ball really. It's almost like links. It's a big ball shape, but it's links, and you can push it in and out. And oh, I know. They're like, they're, yeah, it's the plastic thing, right? Yeah, uh, the plastic right, with, right. with uh, kind of hinges all around it, and it right. opens up as you pull it out wide. It kind of like a, yeah, yeah. I've seen it in yeah. science classes often, yeah. And that's called the Hoberman sphere. So, um, uh, so, and they're all different prices. You can get them bigger or, or smaller. But if you had each child had one of those and they could be pushed in and out as they breathe, that would be something they could do seated right in front of you and, um, and all, all do these breathing exercises. You don't have to be a yoga expert to, to teach kids how to do that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it might, you know, it might spill over into other areas of their life that would be helpful for them. So uh, I think that, uh, and I didn't know about, this i asked my i asked my the board my the other board members i asked them if they could give me any ideas of what they're doing you know with their students at this time how they're starting out online this was a couple of weeks ago and um and that when somebody came up with that and i had never heard of it and i when i looked it up online and and went to google and looked at, um, to amazon and looked at it i thought wow this is really great it's a great way to have kids and you don't have to have them running around the room especially if you have a classroom full of students that you're talking to. So I thought it was really a, a good idea. And puzzles. There are a lot of puzzles and stuff that kids could do that would give them a break. You know, from what's their, interesting... From whatever you were doing in the, in the computer. Judy, you talked about puzzles, and what's interesting is um, I do teach adults. They're all English for specific uh, purposes. They're all... Um, um, foreign students and one of the they all live in dorms they're isolated they're you know they're with the social distancing so they're away from their families and they're alone in their dorms and one of the requests we had from our um um our person who um is in charge of of our social events she was looking for puzzles um because that was one way that that students were at least able to get their brains going and and not you know a lot of them are worried about what's going on in their country because you know that's not always necessarily on the news but puzzles um have been sold out out of many stores <laughs> because uh. some of our teachers are actually looking for the puzzles so so you're right I just went online to try and find this Harry Potter puzzle and send it to my daughter's house. Because if she's, she's home, her husband's working, she's working online, and she has two sons that are in college. They're both, you know, and one's a freshman and one's a senior, and they're both taking their classes online. So they have four people working in the house at the same time that are trying to concentrate on the computer. And I thought, well, it would be nice if they had a table set up and they could just work this puzzle when they felt like it. And it was like eight weeks before I could get it, so I didn't buy it. <laughs> you know, it was really big. Uh, so, so that you know, um, 
that brings me to two things. One is that it's forcing us to be pretty creative in the stuff we're doing because I've seen all sorts of cool things that people are doing and then taking a picture of it. I think one of my um, one of my bosses shared a picture, a really cute picture of her, I think her kindergartner or first grader. One of her tasks was uh, make something interesting out of laundry. And so they had made sort of like this turtle shape and they, they took a picture of their turtle, their laundry turtle, which was pretty neat. Mm. Um, and that's one way, I think, to to help you um, to get rid of that stress. That's one of the things you need to be doing online with kids, is not giving them paper and pencil things or whatever, or having them listen for long periods of time. But assignments like that, that's a, that's a wonderful assignment. All right. And I thought that even for adults, I thought, Hey, I should do that. I, even with my, <laughs> with my students, I, I, it, my, my adult students, you would think that because they're, you know, glued to their cell phone when, when we have normal face-to-face class that they would, you know, that this would be something that, that they're good at, but, but it just becomes really hard on them. And then you have not just a tech barrier, the language barrier, the fact that their families are not there, the fact that they're not getting news. And, and so that actually, I, I was wondering, um, so a lot of our students, um, you know, um, I, we, we saw on Twitter recently, there's a lot of teachers that want to be helpful and they're sharing items on, on COVID-19. And we thought that, uh, and Brent and I were talking about how maybe that actually exacerbates the stress. I have a student, an adult student who said, please do not send anything about coronavirus. Please, I, I just can't, my stress level just goes very high and I, I can't. And, and so that almost that for me, it's almost like relieving the trauma that we're just starting. To, and I, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and how we can, because we are inundated well, by it. I know, I know exactly how that student is feeling because I just posted on Facebook to my friends that I am really, I, I live in um, Northern New Jersey and we're in a hot spot. And, you know, we overnight, New Jersey had it has yes. 9 million people, whole state. And um, we had 4,000 new cases overnight from, from at 10 o'clock last night, there were 4,000 in the last 24 mm-hmm. hours. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we were second only to, to New York in the number of cases in the whole country. And uh, so it's pretty scary. And I, I just feel that, um, in the beginning, I was watching every single show. I was watching when I, every day in, in my house, if you turn on the TV, you're going to see either um, Governor Murphy, which is a, who's the governor of New Jersey. You're going to see Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, and they, they're each getting briefings. You're mm-hmm. seeing um, Mayor de Blasio of New York City, and you're seeing the president. So you have four hours, and every channel you go to, they're on it. So you have four hours yeah. of, of um, I like to look at um, while I'm working. And usually it's some kind of nonsensical talk show or something going on. <laughs> I don't even really listen to it, but I like to have it on. And, um, and so, but that's all it's on. And for, for the first week or 10 days, I was really, I was watching that all day long and it, and it really got depressing. Mm-hmm. So I think basically your student has a point, you know, that enough is enough. Um, I can't help but want to know what the stats are every night, uh, every day. Yeah. But after that, you know, I, I, that's it. That's it. I just, I feel like I have to know that. But, um, but after that, I, I've had it. It's just too much. So um, one of the things that we were thinking about and, and uh, you know, yeah. you have so much information and, and background on uh, social and emotional learning and, some teachers want to know these things and they see SEL and it's posted about it, but they don't really know where to go or um, how to get started with this. And I, of course, some of the ideas that you're talking about are uh, integrated into that. Um, but also if you're, if you're just, you know, if a teacher is just trying to start thinking about these things and they're stuck at home, right. They don't have the opportunities to do uh, you know, courses and trainings and these things where how would you recommend that someone gets started with um social emotional learning and integrating it into their work there's just so many articles that deal with education you social emotional learning um in education and you can you can get so much information 
and basically, um, uh, I I'm, came to the, the conclusion that journaling could be helpful for almost all students. Maybe little ones could draw a picture or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that you can see how, how they're feeling. And also, when you start a session, ask how they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, let the, give them a chance, to, give them a chance to introduce you to their sibling or their pet or whatever, uh, so that they see that you're interested in them, that you see them. And, um, and basically, uh, a journal, can you imagine? I wish I could start a journal when we first, when this first started. I, I really do, because... These kids would have this, you know, 30 years from now, they could look back on this time in their life and say, oh, this is what I wrote during the, you know, the infamous uh, pandemic of 2020. So I, I think that would be a, a great gift that teachers could give to their kids is to have them write something very short and what, depending on their age and have them write a, at least a couple of times a week in a journal. Uh, and that could be a way that, and you could really, you could really incorporate that, incorporate that into, um, into the academic things that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, they keep a record of their life. They link it to whatever they're studying, you know, whatever you're teaching them. And um, uh, and basically, you can say if a child um, is anxious about talking about this, you can say to that child, well, what would you do for a friend who was worried about, you know, the coronavirus? And that would take them out of it. And they're, they become an onlooker looking on to this and they would tell you what they think should be done. And then you're getting an idea of where that child is social, socially and emotionally. Um, so I, I mean, I, I never really studied this in, in school. Um, this is something that I was interested in and I started to, you know, to re read a lot about it. Um, and so, I mean, I draw on a lot of things that happened to me along the way while I was teaching and I'm, I've been out of teaching now. I haven't been in a classroom now in, in 10 years, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just a way to get kids to connect and also give them something that they can carry on in their lives. And, and this is something, that's what I tell my grandson who's a senior in college and he's not having a graduation. He's not having his last semester of school. And, um, and he's really upset about it. So um, mm -hmm. basically this is something he'll carry out into the world. And he'll always think back about the resources that he, that he, um, that he had in order to get past the, the anxiety and whatever that he's feeling. Right. So it does that. And I think that's true of a student of any age. Absolutely. You know, that they, they have, to, you have to have find ways to deal with the anxiety and the, and, and the uh, trauma that they're feeling at this time. Absolutely. And one of the that. ways is to have a, a classroom. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a key to what we're, and I think this is what a lot of teachers do naturally. It's not, we're just putting it into words. But they, they do this naturally and without even thinking about it. And if they read it, they, it affirms, oh, yeah, I'm doing that right. <laughs> so even if they're, people are interested in reading about it, but yeah, I mean, people are interested in reading about it because it affirms what they've already been doing and they didn't really think about it. And they realize that, hey, I'm doing social emotional learning. I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, really helpful for kids. Gosh, you have you have so much to share with us today. Um, I think it's oh, it's just so it's a time for us to reflect and a time for us to, like you said, take care of ourselves um, so that we can um, be there for our students, for the ones that we can be there for. But you're you're absolutely right about those things. Uh, Judy, as we kind of wrap up here, and we really appreciate you giving us your time tonight. I know it's uh, it's a little uh, later for you in the evening and trying to get done with your day. Um, <laughs> but uh, we do normally wrap up with a, with a, a little segment called Fun Finds. And so uh, Ishelle and I will share a couple of ideas. And if you have something that's been uh, hopefully making you happy in the last few days, uh, you can share yours as well. But Ishelle, are you ready to go with yours? I am ready. All right. What do you got? Okay. So my fun find this year 
this year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been a couple of weeks. So my fun find this week is, um, I don't know why I just found out about this. I've heard about it, but I finally had the chance to try it. And it's Google Jamboard, which oh, yeah. is like a virtual um, whiteboard. And it is so cool because you can have all the whiteboards that you want and um, you can share it remotely with your students. You can share a link and they don't have to have a Google account. And that's what saved my butt once again, a Google app this week. So it is, it is um, Jamboard. It's if you just need one Google account, but that's my, um, my fun find. Okay, great. Um, so mine is, uh, it actually ties in with what Judy was saying um, with uh, Judy, your idea about going and, you know, making sure that you're taking a walk or something like that. And so I have been setting myself up for a uh, an early morning walk, uh, you know, before I start the day. So I go for about an an hour, a little less than an hour, and I try to just get out by myself. Um, but I'm also doing a little photo walk for myself. Um, I'm not sharing all the things. It's not really about that. But um, I'm seeing people and companies and things making homemade signs around their their businesses. And I'm just really enjoying the little uh, the little handmade signs that they're talking about, like, you know, hey, we're open, come on in, or, you know, shut down by the gov, or, you know, just like a few different things that, that people are making. Um, and it's just kind of nice to see this uh for me i don't know i just connect to people in a certain way seeing that they're doing just small simple homemade signs that they're putting in their windows of their businesses or they're sticking on their cars or little things like that and so um so uh, i set myself up a little challenge just to try to find one thing uh when i'm on my walks every time and uh, just snap a picture for my own uh, memories for the future Hmm, I want to do something like that. Oh, I think I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to steal that too. Steal that. That's great. I, I think my fun find is um, that I, I, I really have learned, I, I've really been connecting much more with family, with friends. I've had, um, I gave a birthday party for my daughter on uh in the beginning of April with the whole family from all over the US. Um, I've had drinks with fr friends, my husband and I, and we'd, we'd say, you know, we'd talk for about 45 minutes. And I uh, had lunches, lunches with two groups of friends uh, over this time. And normally, you know, I might not see them or talk to them so much. So this has been really, uh, really nice to be able to touch base with all, with all these um, people. I've had, you know, FaceTime. I never FaceTimed before. And I had, you know, talks with family members like that and, you know, individual family members. So it's been really, um, it really makes me feel good to have these connections. That's it wonderful. Really lifts my spirits every wonderful. day when I cannot connect with somebody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, it's been a, it's been a great way to f uh, find uh, some of our old connections that we yeah. haven't haven't always kept up with for everything in the past. Right. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I just want to throw out there that I had uh, our 12 re year reunion with um, a group of uh, they were e e uh, English um, teachers that we were volunteers in Japan. We hadn't talked to each other for such a long time. And we, we, we did it because of what else, you know, we, we had to connect and it was as it wouldn't have happened um, otherwise, I think, but connecting that is, that is, that is great. Right. right absolutely. All right, so uh, we're going to wrap everything up, uh, and thanks everybody so much for listening to the show. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, as always, all the information is out there. Um, I do want to say, you know, just in the spirit of kind of keeping things positive and being grateful for everybody, uh, you know, Ishelle, a couple people have... Uh, donated money to the show through the uh, buy, buy us a coffee thing. And I was really I surprised. I was like, oh, I know. I, you know, like maybe I thought someone would, maybe every once in a while would give a couple dollars and then people were sending in some actual money that'll help us, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we're probably not going to use it for coffee. We're probably going to use it to pay for the show. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I just, I, I'm always grateful when people like show, Hey, this is actually valuable for us. And, uh, there's, there's something worth, uh, worth investing in here. So I just want to say thank you to anybody who's, who's shared out. Um, I, they've kind of come in semi anonymous, so I don't want to shout anybody's names out, mm -hmm. but, uh, but thank you for those of you who have, uh, have sent us, uh, a little coffee. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, as always, we are also a part of Voice Ed Radio, so you can uh, hear it, hear some of us uh, and other uh, ed, uh, education-related shows on Voice Ed. And you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. If, you, um, if you're giving us a shout out any other way, tag us on social media or shoot us an email. Um, we are, you can find the show notes and all of um, Judy's um, articles and links. We'll put them on the show, on the show notes, and that's at diesel.org. Uh, and and also I have been putting it in, so you'll you should be able to find this episode at diesel.org slash fourteen, just the number fourteen directly. Yeah, so it's a, a shorter link now. Mm-hmm. So that's right. You can find us on Twitter. You can find the show at Diesel Pod, and you can find me Ishel at Ixy underscore Pixie. That's I X Y underscore P I X Y. You can find me at Brent G Warner and Judy. Where can people find you? At Judy Haynes. Mm-hmm. And and that's J Y N E S. J U T I E. The I E. Don't get the wrong Judy. Um, and Judy, is there any other places where people can find you or trace, tra- you know, we'll, we'll make sure, like we said, uh, links to your posts on the TESOL blog and all of those types of things. But mm-hmm. um, is there anything that you would like to share that you would like people to know about uh, before we wrap everything up here? Well, I'm just the- just the book that you mentioned at the beginning mm-hmm. of the, um, the beginning of the podcast mm-hmm. that yeah. uh, teaching to uh, teaching to this strength, supporting students living with trauma, violence, and chronic stress. It's really very applicable now. It was published in September two thousand seventeen, but all of a sudden now we're seeing that all those things that we wrote about are very applicable to the situation that's happening right now. Absolutely. We're going to make sure we're linking that on the on the show notes and then we'll we'll be tweeting it out as well. Okay, thank you very much for having me.